You know, people in the name of devotion to the Holy Spirit have found themselves in some really strange... This guy doesn't look all that convinced that it's a good idea. I'm not certain that it is. You know, that practice is based on a single Scripture that I'm not certain Mark wrote. You know, I'm, I think the last few verses of the Gospel of Mark are probably a textual variant that doesn't belong in your Scriptures. And that's the only place you ever get this. But this became this, you know, after the Holy Spirit kind of became a big deal in the last 115 years or so. There was this huge revival of interest in the Holy Spirit. And it led to some really exuberant and kind of crazy practices. That man's eyes are rolled back in his head in church. I don't know that I've ever rolled my eyes back in my head in church. Well, I, I kicked a pew once. Uh, but he is having this profound spiritual experience, and I'm looking at him going, I'm not sure what's going on. In this picture, I know what's going on. That little girl who's kneeling down there has got some sort of health problem, and she's being faith healed. I grew up in a tradition that would mock this. Did you? It is straight up mocking. When I was growing up as a youngster, we used to, at my grandparents' house, their church didn't even start until close to 11. And so we would get up on Sunday morning at, at like 7, I don't know why, and have this huge breakfast that my grandmother would cook, and then they'd turn on the TV and you'd watch the Three Stooges and, and the Little Rascals, and then Ernest Angley, who was a faith healer. And all three of them were treated with about the same level of seriousness. You know, the, the, there was a, a sort of derision for these, what was being labeled as mistakes in an understanding of the Holy Spirit. But it's, it's made our fellowship a little afraid of it. But I'll tell you, I, I wasn't quite done talking about mistakes. You ever hear of this guy? His name is John Crowder. You want to talk about wild. There are videos about this guy on YouTube that he has put up there himself. His deal is that if you want to find him on YouTube, look up Token the Ghost. You know what Token is? I'm not talking about what you use to get on a bus. I'm talking about what you use to become intoxicated with a smoky substance. Okay? That's what he says we should be doing with the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is the most powerful and wonderful intoxicant. And he says, Marijuana, or I'm sorry, Jehovah Wana. I kid you not, he says that. He says it's free. Just reach up into the air, grab you a, a doobie of the Lord. And, and then he will giggle hysterically. <laughs> when I'm talking about mistakes made with the Holy with understanding of the Holy Spirit, I think he gets the crown jewel, don't you? And God is a wonderful presence, and he will lift you into joy and laughter, but he is not an intoxicant. He's kind of the opposite. It leads more towards sobriety than the loss of your mind. But then there's what I grew up in. <laughs> a kind of sanctified stoicness that suggests that the Holy Spirit does very little, if anything at all, a strange virtue of being spiritually cold. I grew up with it being admired to be spiritually cold. That emotionalism was a very bad idea. You don't want to get emotional. You know, I, there were signs that would that would on the over the the uh, door as you're coming into some places that would say, "Enter reverently," and then leave holily. You know, and and because you're supposed to be quiet and calm and orderly and decent and asleep. <laughs> It is so easy to make mistakes with the Holy Spirit. The last 150 years have been, or even a little bit longer than that, have had a big influence on our understanding in churches of Christ of what the Holy Spirit is and does. One big force that has driven what we believe and think has been this one. That's actually a cutting newspaper in Los Angeles in 1906. In April of 1906, this was such a big deal that it actually made the papers. It was the beginning of what we know of as Pentecostalism. As there was a revival in a barn. 
Okay, they couldn't get a building because they had both white and black together in 1906. That was kind of a big deal, but the big deal that became the big deal was the speaking in tongues. And ever since this started going, you know, this has dominated the, it dominated the 20th century in, in terms of a, a renovation of Christianity to the point where one in four self-declaring Christians are charismatic in nature. They, they declare having some sort of gift from the Holy Spirit that is supernatural. Interestingly, the gifts are very rarely things like encouragement or generosity. I have the spiritual gift. Of gen- it's usually faith healing or, or speaking in tongues or something very showy. Something you can really, really, really see and everyone gets caught up with that. <laughs> you, you would think that it would really lead this huge outbreaking would, would be more transformative of character, and that would be its big thrust. But no, it's, it's the ability to do miracles or speak in tongues. Our movement is rational in its nature. The Churches of Christ, in fact, the Restoration Movement as a whole, is a rational movement. We want to understand, think, and know. We seek a clear understanding of Scripture. And this by its nature, was not real rationalistic. In fact, the people who launched this had a slogan, the man with the doctrine is always at the mercy of a man with an experience. You ever heard that? If you were in the Assemblies of God, you would have. And it's still a slogan they say today. Yeah, you may have your doctrine, but I walk with the Lord. Doctrine is what helps you understand the Lord you're walking with. How do you know who you're next to if you don't have good thinking? And this thing drove us away from their errors. But even before, we were fertile for being hyper-rationalistic even before this thing got started because this is 1906. By the way, do you know when the Churches of Christ and the Christian Church split? They departed from one another? 1906. This is a pivotal year for us. There's a reason it had a big influence on us. And made the Holy Spirit difficult for us to really wrestle with. This thing hurt us. But we were ready for that. All the way back, everybody, anybody ever heard the name Alexander Campbell? And he kind of, he was the reformer who got things going towards restoration movement. He and his dad, Thomas, and a good friend of his eventually named Barton W. Stone, they started independent of one another, but eventually met each other, and they worked together to launch the Restoration Movement, to head back towards pure, simple Christianity. Campbell would say this. He says, there are two and only two powers that have effect upon human beings. Physical force and reason. That's it. Those are the only two powers that work on us. Well, that's true if I'm going to try and exercise power over you, right? I can either convince you to do something or I can hold a gun to your head and strip you of... You can either die or do what I said. You know, I can either use reason or I can use physical force. I don't have magic. Right? I can do this at you all I want to and you're going to be like, cut it out. You know? I have yet to say these are not the droids you're looking for and have someone walk away. I can't do that stuff. But then there's, there's this reality that I am not God. And I'm not sure God's limited to those two forces. Living as he does at the tail end of the Enlightenment, Alexander Campbell launched a very Enlightenment-friendly revival movement. And I suspect if he was going to be able to reason to the audience of which he was a part and the people he was trying to reach out to, this is probably a good way of presenting the Gospel. I don't know that it's complete. But then there would be later in the stream another guy named Zachary Taylor Sweeney. Have you ever heard of this man? He's probably a little less known. But building on this idea that there are only two powers, reason and force, as the only two powers that exist that change human beings, you get this kind of reasoning. The Holy Spirit acts upon human beings by the Word of God. Just that alone. And... He never acts upon human beings specially or apart from the Word. Have you ever heard that teaching? I see a lot of you going... 
I will tell you that it dominated a lot of churches of Christ. To go on, he would say the promises of the Holy Spirit's special personal empowerment, not in dwelling, because in dwelling can only be understood figuratively, but empowerment. That there would be a special way that there would be an empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Those promises, especially those made in John chapter 14 through 16, are for the apostles alone. They have no relevance to anyone else. Like there are lots of things that show up in our Scripture that were only for the apostles. And they're interesting history, but they don't really matter in the Christian life. I think it was written down for us. Now this, <laughs> this is enlightenment talking. Okay? Or perhaps, <laughs> most terrifying to me, the Holy Spirit's indwelling should be understood as a, figure, a figurative use of speech. As the Spirit of God does not actually enter anyone. Ever. So demons can get into you. But the Holy Spirit doesn't. And that would have shocked Ezekiel, who says point blank, and the Spirit entered me. I mean, it would have really come as a surprise to him. But he would say, now that's figurative. Because if the Spirit of God goes into a person that divinitizes the person, they become a God-man, and that's only happened once. I mean, he's seriously a student of the Enlightenment. But the amount of power that these people that most of us don't really know all that much about have over our movement is pretty big. Because it influences an understanding of the Spirit and makes it hard for us. Okay? Because this doesn't... I'm sorry, but this doesn't line up with Scripture. Let me show you just one example. Three examples, really, but one concept. Now, to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. By the way, that's not by the gospel and preaching of Jesus Christ. It is according to that. That the gospel and preaching of Jesus Christ tell you that God is able to strengthen you. It's not how you're strengthened. That tells you that He is able to do it. Or, how about this? that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant that you may be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being. Do you see that? A strength that comes from God inside of you? Not something that comes by you being convinced, but something that happens to you because it's done to you? You see that that's what the Scripture says? Or after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to His eternal glory in Christ will Himself restore, confirm, strengthen, there it is again, and establish you. That He's actually able to do stuff to you. Okay? So in these verses, God is not sharing information to help us think better. Okay? He is giving us strength to be better. Those are different things. This is not, strictly speaking, a reasoned-based activity of God. It is an action of God. But it is not physical force. He is not making you do anything. He is sharing strength with you. I can't do that. I, mean, I go into situations where people grieve and hurt all the time, where I would love to give my strength to them, but I can't. You know, But God can. God gives strength. How do I know? Because I believe the Bible. And it says so. So how does He do it? <laughs> I wish that there, that was explained. It's left in mystery. But mystery doesn't mean it's not true. It's something that happens. Something that God does. And in contrast with Pentecostalism, this kind of strengthening, seen as I think a primary action of the Holy Spirit. It's one of the things He does to make us able to live the life of Christ. And it's not showy at all. When the Holy Spirit is doing this, even the person it's done to might not notice. And people around them definitely won't. You'll be surprised by it when you get cut off in traffic and you don't swear. Like, why am I not mad right now? Holy Spirit, He has changed you. He has helped you. And you didn't see it happening, but you became strong enough to live by the commandments of God. 
It's not showy at all. It doesn't show off, but it's real. And in contrast with Campbell, this is neither of those kinds of power that he accepted. This is something else. It is a spiritual power, a spiritual force. It is not physical force. And it is not persuasive, strictly speaking, although it enables you to do what you are persuaded to do, but it is a power and a strength that doesn't come from human reason. It doesn't come from us at all. It comes from the Spirit of God. And in contrast with Sweeney, this promise is from the Word, but it doesn't use the Word. Okay, The Ephesians passage says He's going to make you strong in your inner being. He doesn't say, when you study your Bible or something. No, it's by the Spirit. The Spirit's going to make you strong. In contrast with Sweeney, this is a promise that is not obviously restricted to the apostles. This is for the church as a whole throughout the ages. And also in contrast with Sweeney, this is a promise that God will, by His Spirit, interact directly with human beings to strengthen us. That the Spirit is going to interact with you to make this happen. You know, you ever anybody ever done that activity? I'm so bad at that, I broke my finger doing it once. But you may be familiar with these black things. I'm very familiar with these black things. You know... Those are called gutters. The lane is there in the middle. The gutters are on either side. Or Have you ever been out driving and seen? I love this picture. I had to look for it for a long time. There is a car in that ditch and a car in this ditch. So many roads have deep ditches on both sides, right? Well, what I've been putting in front of you today is a couple of big mistakes. A couple of bad directions to head with the Spirit. An excess of showiness and exuberance and a denial of His active presence. They are like on either side. And because we have spent so much time seeing people wander into ditch after ditch, we have spent a awful lot of our lives saying, let's not deal with this. I grew up in church. I'm not sure I heard a sermon like what I'm doing right now. A sermon that focused on the Holy Spirit, much less a series of eight. I didn't grow up with that. You know, but the sound understanding of the Holy Spirit is real, and the fact that there are ditches should not keep us from talking about Him. It should not keep us from thinking about Him. Because there are gutters, do people not bowl? Because there are ditches, do you fail to drive? I don't think any of you walked here. In all likelihood, you drove by a ditch. Let us spend time in thought about the Holy Spirit. But why does it matter? I mean, if it's so dangerous, and it is, those mistakes are crazy. Okay? And they drive people to really, really hard places where Jesus Himself becomes overshadowed and the Holy Spirit is all about showing people Jesus. And He does not want the spotlight. If He did, He would show up a ton in Scripture. You know, like as active character. And as it is, he makes cameos. Now, I think he is everywhere in the whole thing. He's the force that inspired it. He made it happen. But he doesn't call attention to himself. And he doesn't want us focused exclusively on him, which is why I'm not going to preach about him for a year. But why does this matter? Because we live in a world marked by darkness. Earlier this year, there was a blackout in New York City. And there were people that the blackout did not affect. Do you see that? Streets that are still lit up. But do you notice how there are streets and there's whole areas that are in darkness? Folks, welcome to your world. And the light of the world has been poured out on us. And there are so many people who walk the dark streets without Him. And they walk in darkness going, is this the best it can get? Am I all alone here in the dangerous dark? And the Christian answer is no. You do not live alone in this world. Yes, there are evil spiritual forces. There really are. Just like if you walk out into the woods, you might meet a bear or a bobcat or a wolf. There are dangerous spiritual critters out there. But you are also close to a wondrous God who is stronger than any of them. You are not alone and never have to be. Through what Jesus Christ has done for us, we live in the presence of the Spirit of God. The long-awaited promise has been kept. Why do I say that? Because my Bible says that. 
You know, the, the big thing that people started paying attention to in, in Christianity, they really get hung up on Pentecost. You've got to know that Pentecost was the fulfillment of a thing that's been going for a long time. A long-awaited promise. Not a new thing, not a surprise, but something God had always planned. That mighty rushing wind was always supposed to come. It was planned and intended and promised. Okay? But this is what happened. The day of Pentecost arrived, they're all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as He gave them utterance. And then we have later in the sermon, we have this word from Peter, which is kind of the big focus today. Therefore, being exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. The Holy Spirit is poured out. The promise from the Father is poured out. Peter chose those words very carefully. Because that, what promise is he talking about? Well, it's not a promise. God makes it again and again again and again, and again, and again. We'll look at just a couple of them and we'll wrap up. He says the promise pouring out looks like this. This is in the book of Isaiah. It says, For the place is forsaken, the populous city is deserted, the hills and the watchtower have become dens forever, a joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks. That sounds pretty bad, right? Jerusalem when in Isaiah's day didn't look like this. And he's saying this is what's coming. An emptying out, a horror, that that things will be terrible. But I think bigger than that even, it speaks to the brokenness of the darkened world that you and I live in. How sad and sorrowful and broken and desperate is this place until, until the Spirit is poured out from upon us from on high. Do you hear those words, poured out? It's not a drop that lasts for a day. This is a pouring out of the Spirit. A permanent change in the existence of reality. And the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is deemed a forest. That it brings back life where there was death. That it restores the beauty and the wonder of the world. And that's figurative. What will it look like really? Well, then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness abide in the fruited field, and the effect of righteousness will be peace, and the result of righteousness, quietness, and trust forever. That is what the Spirit of God is sent to accomplish. Though all the showy things that He ever did attention, this is the goal. That we would become righteous people who live in peace. And that we live in the quietness and the wonder of God and beauty and trust with each other. And this has always been the plan. A poured out Spirit on broken humanity to redeem us. This is what He wants to do. Ah, that's one Scripture. You're probably twisting that. Oh, okay. For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and the streams of dry ground. I will pour out My Spirit upon your offspring. I will pour out My Spirit upon the apostles. I will pour out My Spirit upon a generation. No! I will pour out My Spirit upon your offspring and My blessing upon your descendants. This is a permanent thing that moves forward through Christian history. Or... And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put My Spirit within you. I'm putting this in you. It's going to be with you. How close? Well, how close is your heartbeat? I will put My Spirit within you and you shall live and I will place place you in your own land. He's going to put the Spirit inside of us and I will not hide My face anymore from them when I pour out My Spirit upon the house of Israel, declares the Lord God. Or, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out My Spirit on all flesh, your sons and your daughters. So this is the one that Peter quotes in his sermon. You see why he chose those words? When you pour something out, you don't generally drink it. And you don't get it back in a container. You don't withdraw what's poured out. It is going to be poured out and it goes. And for all of human history, and this is what Peter was saying, you're seeing it right now. Those promises that God made, they are going to have a permanent change in the world. And you're watching it happen 
right before your eyes. The Spirit has been poured out. Folks, this is big a change as has ever happened to the world. If the Holy Spirit was not a new player in the story. He shows up in the Bible. He even comes upon people and makes them do things. You know, King Saul spoke in tongues. But never was this done. Because He is permanently given to everyone who will come to Christ. That in baptism we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's not some gift He gives us. It's Him Himself. He gives us Himself to be within us. And folks, that changes everything. The Gospel has changed everything, and this is included in the Gospel. So what in the world is He doing? So He's inside it. What is He doing? Well, there's a reason I'm going to preach eight sermons. I mean, it may feel like I've already done that, but there's a lot to talk about. But this sermon, I just want to focus in on this one truth. He is in the world. We are not alone. The Holy Spirit is active in the world in which we live. You might despair because of who is president or who runs the Senate or who runs some country in the world. You might despair because of who runs your company or what kind of job prospects you've got. You might despair because of all these things. And all those things are there. They're all real. The Holy Spirit of God is in the world. Do not despair. He is stronger than any of those forces. And He is bringing about His will. Do you trust Him? Walk with Him. Walk by Him because here's even better news than the fact that He's in the world. He is in us. And those who walk by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the flesh. We are able to do with Him what we could never do without Him. He has strength to share and can change the human heart. Even you can't do that to yourself. But He can. He is the recreating God who makes us new and powerful and able to live. Behold your God because He is great and mighty and able to save. The Holy Spirit leads us to Jesus Christ, our Savior. and empowers us to live together with Jesus Christ, our Savior, listening to His way and living by His way. Not only do we hear the Word, but we live by the Word. Why do we do that? Why are the righteous deeds of the law fulfilled in us? Because the Spirit makes it possible. So we hear and we obey, but that obedience is not ours alone. It is also the work of the Spirit of God as He makes a transformed person out of Christians. He is in us. And folks, I asked earlier, what difference in the world does it make? It makes all the difference in the world. Especially in the world that you live in that is filled with forces that are not related to God, that are not pulling you toward God. He is God. And He will deliver you to God. He is the God guide to God. He makes all the difference in the world. Maybe that there's somebody here who's really not walking with Him very much. Maybe like me, you weren't trained in how to do it. You weren't expected to do it. Well, if so, the the very first step is prayer, and this church will pray for you. We want to. It's a praying church. Maybe that you came here today and you had absolutely nothing that touched you in this sermon, but you came here carrying a burden. Don't leave here with a burden. You don't have to. This church will pray for you. And if you're not a Christian, there's no better day than this one, to begin following Jesus Christ our Lord. If this morning you're subject to God's invitation, come right now. There's room here. Come while we stand and sing.